morning, everyone. We're going to get started, so come on in and grab a hymn book. Turning to number 229, 229, Since I Have Been Redeemed. Let's all stand as we sing this morning. Number 229 in our hymn books, Since I Have Been Redeemed. I have a song I love to sing since I have been redeemed. In our hymn books, we're going to go to that last stanza, number four. I have a home prepared for me since I have been redeemed. Eternally since I have been redeemed. Since I have been redeemed. Since I have been redeemed. Please be seated. Come on up here, boys and girls. We're going to sing Zacchaeus was a wee little man. And a wee little man was he. Did a lot of climbing out here in sycamore trees. At least that's what I read. How y'all doing this morning? Did y'all wish your moms happy Mother's Day? All kinds of fun things like that. Hi, Ava. How are you? Or Kaylee. How are you? All righty. Zacchaeus. Was a wee little man. That we uh, Zacchaeus was a wee little man. All right, here we go. Here we go. Yep, here we go. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree, and he said, Zacchaeus. You come down, for I'm going to your house today, for I'm going to your house today. Well, that was simple. All right, good job, boys and girls. Real easy one today. All righty. See y'all later. That was a fun song. Hey, both of them stood up there today. That was, that was good. Good job, Dad. All right. Well, happy Mother's Day to all the moms. It's good to be here in the Lord's house today. We have an outline for everyone this morning. We are house-sitting for Buzz and Joy this week, and uh, which, which entails ducks and chickens and dogs and rabbits and parakeets and whatever else. So uh, I'm a little dishuffled this morning. I had to br have somebody bring my belt this morning. I forgot I wear out my collar stays so if my shirt starts sticking way up in the air, uh, get some duct tape or something to hold them down. My son, Eric, I, was that birthday? I don't know. It's got, it's, how did I meet? Ten years ago? It was Christmas, some, some kind of holiday. He bought me titanium collar stays. And so if you don't know what a collar stay is, that's the gentleman. Many of your shirts have like, empty spaces right there where these metal rods get stuck up in there. So the titanium ones are amazing. They're bulletproof, you know, so it ever shoots me in the neck. Just like this, you know, like a superhero. And uh, anyway, I've lost, I forgot my collar stays this morning, so I'm, I'll be paranoid all during the sermon. They'll be, they'll be doing like this, you know. Do I need to move my mic up or just stop fidgeting with it? Like that. Can you hear that? Yeah. Okay. All right. Is that better? All right. One of, one of the titanium would interfere with the, uh, okay. We are, I got a new outline coming around for everyone this morning. And um, we're going to be, we're going to start in the book of Daniel today. We are going through, uh, of course, the doctrine of bibliology with study of the Bible. And we, of course, we have hit so many topics over the last several months and, talk, you know, starting with things like inspiration and 
preservation and all those great doctrinal things. And uh, last couple of weeks we were talking about the presentation and that is, you know, what exactly we see when we have the Bible. We talked about, uh, you know, things like punctuation and capitalization and italicized words and all those type of things. Uh, and uh, today, um, probably today and maybe next week, at least maybe two weeks, who knows, um, we're going to talk about investigation, and this is not necessarily a doctrine. It's not like the doctrine of investigation at all. Please notice the note that's in the top there. Understanding the meaning of the doctrines associated with the Bible uh, would be shallow if at the end of it all you didn't know pers- you didn't did not personally understand the message of the Bible. And so we're going to be talking about uh, today, getting started with that, and the next week at least, talking about personal. Bible study, and that certainly has to be a part of any understanding of of the Bible itself, because the Bible itself um, is a tremendous book, it is powerful, it's quick and powerful, and I believe it is the very words and word of God, but uh, it is of little, um, it's of little effectiveness unless you're willing to spend some time in it, and that is to sit down and read it and study it. There is a difference between Bible reading and Bible study. Um, there's, it's not like, you know, if you don't do one and don't do the other, you're, you're missing out. What I am saying is it's important to read your Bible, but it's also important to study your Bible. And so when we're, t- we're going to be talking about a little bit about Bible study today and tomorrow or next week. Uh, and this is, a, it's not an academic exercise. Um, uh, of course, um, those that have the opportunity of, um, you know, uh, getting involved in Bible studies, in other words, with other people. That's fantastic. I have no problem with that. I encourage it. Uh, but we're, we're talking mainly about is personal Bible study. That's you with your Bible, maybe uh, you and your spouse or you and your kids. Uh, but we're talking about more of a personal at-home type of thing when we talk about Bible study uh, today. And um, I wanted to start in Daniel. Uh, it's just a great place to do to introduce the subject. We've talked, we've looked at this passage of scripture, probably way at the beginning of the study of bibliology, and I've made reference to this portion in Daniel many times. Daniel chapter nine is a great chapter. It's one of those pivotal chapters in the scriptures. Uh, you'll we're introduced uh, it, further on in Daniel chapter nine to God's um, as I use kind of jokingly reply to it, God's day planner. And as he talks about this, the 70 weeks have been determined and he talks about um, the coming of, basically the coming of the Messiah and him being cut off. And, and, and so that is an, actually all that information in Daniel chapter 9, all those end time things that, that he mentions is a result of the prayer that Daniel prayed and that's a result of a Bible study. He sat down and, and that's what we're going to talk about this morning and as we introduce this topic today. Uh, Daniel chapter 9, uh, just remain seated. In verse number 1, it says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, Ahash, the seed um, of the Medes, uh, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. And so time frame wise, of course, this is the book of Daniel. This is going to talk about Daniel. Daniel was, a, was young. Uh, when he was taken into captivity, when the Babylonians came and um, uh, began to uh, take over the city of Jerusalem, there were three separate occasions they came in. Uh, Daniel would have been taken out in the earliest occasion. Um, Ezekiel would have come out the second time around. The third time around when the Babylonians came in, they actually destroyed the city and destroyed the temple. Uh, and, and it was a very brutal invasion that third time around but Daniel he's been in captivity for quite a long time now and um, nearly nearly 70 years at this point and um, excuse um, uh, 40 years at this point 70 years at this point I'll get it right but um, he uh, he would have been either in his late teens possibly or young, uh, young adult at this time when he was taken into captivity. So he's been there all of his, all of his adult life. And, and so um, we, uh, we know here um, that uh, Daniel is still there. The Babylonian Empire fell to the, Medes, the Medo-Persian Empire 
Um, the Bible actually records that for us, and of course there's a tremendous amount of historical records of that, uh, of that downfall, the Babylonian Empire, so it's not something that happened in a vacuum. And so um, as with so many transitions of power, there's a lot of people, a lot of heads roll during times like that, but Daniel's, of course, did not. Uh, Daniel um, was a, an advisor to the king, uh, during his lifetime, the Babylonians, and now he's going to be an advisor to the king during his time with the Medo-Persian Empire. And so he, he makes it through that transition just fine. Of course, God is the one who's doing that. And it, it's during this period of time that um, he's beginning to ask some questions. And so, hence, we go to verse number two. And in the first year of the reign of his reign, talking about, of course, um, Darius, or Darius, as some people say. It all depends on where you're from, I suppose. Um, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the Lord, um, where the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fastings and sackcloth and ash. In verse number four, and I prayed. And we'll stop right there and let's, let us, let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for um, this Lord's Day. I, it's Mother's Day, and it's a great uh, opportunity of celebrating the great blessings uh, that our moms have been in our lives, our spouses. And uh, Father, I just want to thank you that you have blessed our ministry with some tremendous women that have... Um, done so much of the work of the ministry and encouraged all of us uh, to f um, follow close to you. And now, Father, I just want to thank you, Lord, for the occasion of Sunday school, the opportunity of opening your word, and I pray, Lord, you teach us, uh, even this day, uh, to be students of your word. And, Lord, I just want to thank you for what you accomplish here today. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, you can see here that uh, we have a couple of things that Daniel um, does. And, and the outline is a very simple outline this morning. Um, just it, Really, it's a way of introducing the subject of personal Bible study. And um, you see Daniel, of course, is mentioned here. And he, the Bible tells us he understands by books the number of years where the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah the prophet. Now, Jeremiah the prophet... He, we're talking about, you know, 100 plus years prior to that. Jeremiah was uh, there in Jerusalem. He was a prophet during that period of time where the Babylonian Empire was growing. Um, the Assyrian Empire had uh, devastated the northern kingdom. The, the Assyrian Empire began to deteriorate. Uh, the Babylonians basically took over quite a bit of what the Assyrians had accomplished. Now the Babylonian Empire is growing the sins of the northern kingdom of Israel were punished by God through the Assyrians. And there was a series of prophets that God had sent to the northern kingdoms. And they ministered and preached and called on people to repent. And that, of course, did not transpire. And so that captivity took place for the north. And so now Jeremiah comes on the scene. And he is preaching. He's prophesying. Um, the book of Jeremiah is not only a series of, of messages that you see there, but it's also the historical account of all those events. And, and of course, Jeremiah's taken into prison. He's thrown into a, to a, a, a muddy pit. You think of that like an old cistern type of thing. And, and so there's a lot that transpires historically in the book of Jeremiah, but all those prophecies are there. God is talking to the people, saying, this is what's going to happen if you don't repent. Um, this is what I'm. This is what the Babylonians are going to do. They're going to come in. They're going to destroy this place. They're going to take you captive, and 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 part of that message, of course, is the timing. And so it's laid out there. Now, um, I'm not. I, I, I'm not going to say that that uh, you know that Daniel was not familiar a lot with what Jeremiah said. I'm sure he was, but the details of it, what he, what we see here is that he had a collection of the writings of Jeremiah. Um, please do remember that they would not have had, you know, this nice structured type of book in front of them where, the, you know, Dan would just kind of flip through and follow all the cross-references and fun things like that, okay? They would have been a collection of scrolls, especially something like Jeremiah, which would be, this was like, this led right up to the captivity. And so... 
the writings of Jeremiah, these are collections of different sermons and prophecies. So they would have been written down on scrolls and copied and copies of copies. And we've talked about that before. And, and of course, now there's a, um, you know, there is correspondence between what's going on in Jerusalem and over in the now Medo Persian Empire, of course, the Babylonian Empire, there's still this, co this communication going back and forth. We're, we're going to even see, like, for instance, you get to the book of uh, Nehemiah, you're going to see people traveling back and forth and making, giving reports and things like that. So there's, there's that communication there. So over this period of time, Daniel's gotten some copies of the writings of Jeremiah, and he is, he's, he's at a point in his life where he's really asking, I would imagine, asking some questions. What is God up to? <laughs> What's the plan? What does, you know, we've been taken into captivity. The, the city of Jerusalem has been destroyed. The temple is destroyed. you got to remember that Isaiah would have been, excuse me, Daniel would have been very familiar with all the promises made in the Old Testament concerning the children of Israel and the promised land and the city of Jerusalem, a place where God had placed his name, the, this construction of the temple, uh, the promises of a, of a kingdom in the future. And so, I would imagine all these things are kind of weighing on his mind, and he's asking the hard questions. What happened? What do we need to do? What's God up to? What's the next step? And, and here he is. And so what does he do? Well, he starts reading the prophecies of Jeremiah. Um, if you would, he starts a little bit of a Bible study to figure out what God was up to. And, and so... There is, um, it forces him to, to the books. This is, um, you know, personal Bible study, again, is not just an academic thing where we're just going to, you know, try to figure everything out and we just, so we can know everything. Um, it is often driven by a curiosity, an interest of wanting to know more about a particular subject uh, or maybe a particular person in the Bible or a particular book in the Bible particular time frame in the Bible, there's, there's some, usually something that's back there, but it's a, it drives us to the book itself, to the Word of God. You know, the Bible um, is a book. Uh, you'll notice it does say plural there. I, the reason, um, the reason that it's, it has a plural there, I believe, is because the, uh, the scroll, there were multiple scrolls involved in Jeremiah's prophecies, and of course, ultimately, they were collected together, and we have the book of Jeremiah. If you read through that book, you'll see uh, there, are, um, there are several different sections. Um, you'll see in particular he has his scribe write out a particular prophecy uh, and read to the king who tears it up and burns it, you know. So there are sections uh, to it in, the, in that sense. Um, but, the, you know, the, the Bible uh, is referred to as a book. I, I'm just going to read a couple texts. If you'd like to turn there, these are just one verse. As a matter of fact, the one you'd be very familiar with some of you have Joshua 1.8 memorized. Who can recite Joshua 1.8? Christian Joy. The book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe and do according to all that is written therein day and night. No, I messed that up. Day and and night. then thou, thou shalt, shalt make thy way. Prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Most excellent. If you want to sing that, you can sing it too. Not at the moment. Okay, all right. And so Joshua 1.8, um, it starts off by this book of the law. And so that recognition that there is this collection of writings, and of course the book of the law would have been the writings of Moses. And of course th that is now right after, of course now Joshua um, is now in, you know, uh, facing the Jordan River going into the promised land, and the writings of Moses are there. Moses would have penned those things during those 40 years of wandering through the wilderness, and now he has a book. And so the, the book is the collection of God's word placed in a, in a format. And so um, I'm just going to read another portion that's from Exodus 24, 7. And he took the book of the covenant. And so what, it, that, what that is is those very specific things that God had given Moses in reference to the law itself, Okay. And so we would think about that maybe as the book of Exodus and, and uh, talking about the, the time in Mount Sinai. Um, so this book of the covenant and read it in the audience of the people and they said, all that the Lord hath said will we do and be obedient. And so 
so we understand that, you know, the Bible is a book, and that book is uh, where the Word of God is, is contained. It is the Word of God. And so if we want to know the Word of God, we need to get into the book. You need to read it, but you also need to spend time studying. Nehemiah chapter 8, keep your place here in Daniel chapter 9, if you would, please, and go back just a, um, quite a bit, the book of Nehemiah. Um, yeah, I'll get there. There it is, right before Psalms and Esther and all those great books. Nehemiah chapter 9. Time frame wise, we're after the book of Daniel uh, in, in timing, uh, as far as timing goes, but uh, the book of Nehemiah chapter 8. And I love this chapter. Um, uh, and all the people gathered themselves together. Uh, as one man unto the street that was before the water gate, and uh, they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, uh, which the Lord had commanded Israel. And Ezra the, the priest uh, brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear uh, with understanding. Um, I always kind of view that as being the, the kids, uh, men and women, and all that, uh, as it says here, all that could hear and understand. So I think of that as, as the children that were there upon the first day of the seventh month. And so this is um, a time where the, uh, uh, they had gotten together. The construction of the city of Jerusalem, of course, is, um, is complete. And now they're um, spending some time there. Uh, Ezra, of course, uh, you can read the book of Ezra. That's a great transitional book concerning this whole period of time, even time of, of Daniel. Um, and he read uh, therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday before the men and the women and those that could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. And, and so um, if we, if we want to understand things, we've got to get ourselves in the book. And I just want to remind you that this book that we have here is not just any kind of book. It is the word of God, but it has to be read. And I don't know about you, but uh, when I was younger, I detested reading. I, got, I tried to get a, a, around it every way possible. I remember uh, in, in school, um, I am not a big, and I've told you all this, I'm not a big fiction reader. I've never really enjoyed fiction. Um, I'm always uh, mostly nonfiction kind of person. Um, I, I was like that ever since I was a child. I, I couldn't stand reading all the assignment, signed books that they had in high school. I detested them. I remember, you know, uh, things like, uh, what is that, uh, Lon uh, Jack London's book, A White Fang. I don't think I ever did read that in high school, you know. I probably just fudged my way through all the tests. Boys and girls, don't listen now at this period of time. And uh, just do what, your, do what your parents say and, and uh, follow, follow all your teacher's guidelines there. But I couldn't stand reading in high school. And... Um, um, I, was, I was never uh, big on, on fiction, always detested it. Um, I think the first, uh, the first book I ever remember enjoying reading was actually a ph philosophical book. We, uh, of course, I went to Catholic school, so this would have been a Catholic religious class. And it was a book on, um, uh, let me see, what's the guy's name? The guy's name was Eric Fromm. This is, you know, this is back in seventy. 1977, somewhere around that time frame, and um, it was it was a book on self actualization written by a guy, a philosopher named religious philosopher named Eric Fromm. That's the first book I ever read that I actually enjoyed. That's weird, and uh, and I, I remember it so well, and because uh, it was it was the first actual book in high school that we actually had to read that wasn't fiction. And I'm thinking, finally, we found something that's not fictitious, you know. Um, but um, so I was, I, was never, I was never a big reader, hate, detested it. Um, I, I, after I got saved, I'd never really read the Bible at, at all. But after I got saved, I started reading the, the Bible, and I, f I just fell in love with it. And um, just couldn't get enough of it. I just wanted to read it as much as I possibly could. And it, it wasn't a fiction or nonfiction type of thing. It wasn't, a, um, it wasn't about um, subject matter in reference to something, you know, that kind of interests me, so I might read it type of thing. It, it wasn't that way at all. I just, I, I, I came to an understanding, and of course driven by the Holy Spirit of God, uh, that this book was something extremely special 
and that if I was, if I was going to develop this, uh, this, this faith that God has now brought into my life, I'm going to need to spend time in this book. It was just that simple. And, and so I've, I've not gotten over that. And so uh, all these years later, I still read my Bible as often as I can. I wish I could read it more, and I probably should read it more. Um, but when we talk about Bible study, we're talking about this book. All right. There's a lot of other books out there. I know that. We're going to talk a little bit about that probably this morning. But, um, but this, it's about this book, not about other books. It's not about study guides. It's about this book um, because this is the book that God gave, gave us. Now, so when Daniel is there, he's got a lot of stuff stirring in his head. A lot of things are happening around him. Um, the, the Babylonian Empire has collapsed. The Medes have taken over. Uh, Darius is there. Uh, he's going to play a key role in the restoration of the children of Israel, of course, back to Jerusalem. Uh, but God is, is really doing something, and Daniel wants to know what that is. And so what does he do? He gets into the book. He starts reading and searching for answers. And, of course, God's going to give him answers. Please notice back in our text there in Daniel chapter 9, as it says there, um, in, again in verse number two, he said he understood by books the number of the years. And so we have this, we, we have what the Bible says, understanding. And, and so we're not talking about, uh, we're not talking about some, you know, some divine illumination, you know, where some light beam shot through a crack in a window somewhere and illuminated some page, anything like that, okay? He was reading his, he was reading his Bible and said, there it is. It's right there. How come I didn't see that before? God has, God has already got this plan going. We're right in the middle of what God's doing. This is phenomenal. Everybody needs to hear this. And he knew exactly what God was up to because he read God's word and he understood it. And again, it's, this is not academics. It's about understanding uh, what God has said and how it applies to our lives. I mean, when you, when you read something, you know, maybe you're reading your Bible and you're, and you're reading some things about the love of God, and, it, you know, it, it's, it doesn't puff us up. It does, doesn't make us, you know, like, for instance, well, I know all about the love of God, and I'm going to tell you all about it. You know, it's not that kind of thing at all. It, it brings peace and solitude uh, because you begin to understand how much God loves you. When you, begin to, when you begin to read the Bible and understand like the power that God has and, is, and, and the, all those great omnis that you read about in, you know, in uh, theology proper, and all of a sudden you realize you know, God is able to do unbelievable things. And that, that gives me a tremendous amount of confidence of being in, in serving him because I know that he's able. I may not be able, but he is. It gives me confidence. It gives me um, a feeling of um, that when God get, instructs me or leads me to do something, that it's going to be able to be accomplished. Um, and so the more that we understand, again, it's not academics. It begins to build our faith. It makes it stronger. It focuses our attention away from self and on him. Because we're finding out this information in his word, what he has said to us about himself and what he's up to. Um, I'm reading from the book of, um, uh, book of Psalms. This is Psalm 119. And I'm, I'm just uh, a couple verses, uh, beginning of verse number 98, just down, a few, th down through a few verses. Um, Though through thy commandments hast, um, excuse me, let me get this right. Um, Thou, through thy commandments, hast made me wiser than mine enemies, for they are ever uh, with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. Now, I'm always intrigued with that verse. We talked about that months ago. This is not a statement of pride on the psalmist part here. It's, a, it's, a, it's the reality, and, and that's the goal of every teacher anyway, to make his students wiser than he is. And so uh, what, it, what the psalmist is saying is, I learned my lesson, I was taught very well, and I'm following through on that. And, um, and I think about the word of God often. I understand more than, my, than the ancients, he says, because I have kept thy precepts. 
Of course, the psalmist, when he's writing here, his ancients are the ones that uh, um, God would have judged because of, of, of their sinfulness. He's learned lessons from the ancients. He's learned from their mistakes. And uh, he's learned to keep the word of God. And so, you know, the psalmist understands, uh, the, the, the psalmist that wrote Psalm 119 understands that um, um, the Word of God has accomplished a lot of things in our life, and, and it can accomplish things in our lives. We should have a desire to understand what the Word of God says. And so um, Bible study is about this, um, this, this whole process of, of directing ourselves to the book the Word of God with the, with the idea of the desire to understand what it has to say. And, and so, but for a particular purpose, the determination, if you would, there from Daniel chapter 9, um, what, it, what, Daniel, what, what happened with Daniel, you'll see, in, of course, in uh, verse number 3, he set his face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplication. And so he just, he wanted to know what God was up to. So he spent time in the Word of God, he understood some things about God's timetable as far as the Babylonian captivity and the timing and what God was doing. And what that did was it drove him to even seek more information and drove him to prayer and to get a hold of God. The, the end result of Bible study is not just the Bible study itself. There should be something that comes from that. There, there should be a result. There should be... Um, a, a, an understanding. There should be a, uh, something that drives us uh, to, to accomplish because of what we've read in the Word of God. And so the end result of studying your Bible is not just that you studied your Bible. There should be something more. And um, so we're going to talk about Bible studying uh, over the, today and, and uh, into next week a little bit. And But again, this is... Um, it's not an academic uh, exercise. Um, I do want to say very clearly that it, there is no, there is, you know, you got to do it this way. There is no this way. There's a lot of different things you can do. Um, and I've done a lot of different things over the years, and I'm sure most of you have done the same thing. And so this is um, what we'll talk about um, coming up now is, is not just, you know, this is the way you ought to do it. Um, but if you, um, if you read your Bible, amen. And I'm, I'm thankful for that. Um, but I know that there's more to it than just reading your Bible. And so um, I want to talk a little bit about Bible studies. You'll, you'll notice at the bottom there, and I have a, just a couple things there, types. And um, I have uh, get, a, get, a, get a Bible study, and then I have get into the Bible and study. Now, that particular point there is get a Bible study. There are a lot of Bible study materials available. And I, I don't, I'm, I'm not against that at all. As a matter of fact, um, many of you have been through the ABCs of Christian Growth, which is a Bible study. Um, I've taught it myself personally to many of you that are here and, and others have been taught by others that are here and some of you have done it on your own. It's set up that either way. Uh, what I like about the ABCs of Christian growth is, is that um, it's not a commentary. Um, it, what it is is it kind of forces you to get in your Bible and read particular things and answer some very you know, basic questions. And to me, a Bible study that gets you in your Bible is doing what it's supposed to do. Um, when, when I got saved... Um, the, uh, the, the pastor that was at that church, he gave me a Bible study. And it was, uh, it was one of those, you know, um, four, it was, I think it was four steps for new Christians. Very simple. I don't know. I'm not sure who wrote it. I probably still, because I never throw anything away. I probably still have it somewhere in some file or in some box somewhere. It was really simple. And it was four basic things, you know, uh, things concerning church attendance, or I'm sorry, I think the first thing was about baptism. Now that you're saved, you need to be baptized. And a lesson on baptism. There's a lesson on church attendance. There was a lesson on um, Bible reading and prayer. Uh, there was actually a lesson on tithing. And so I think that were the four things. And it was very simple. The pastor would come over uh, every, every week and say, Have you, you know, we, I would go through the lesson. He'd come over, 
he talked through the thing, do you have any questions? And I'm like, you know, what about this and what about that? And, um, you know, one of the things I discovered not only during that period of time when I was doing that as a, as a Bible study, but uh, through a lot of the Bible studies I've done with other people, a lot of times the, uh, the Bible study is, is simply a springboard to talk about a lot of other theological questions and Bible questions that people have because often it just kind of generates an open discussion about things, which is no problem at all. I'm not, I'm not, I don't mind rabbit trails as long as there's a rabbit at the end of it, okay? And so um, that was, the, that was the, you know, my, my introduction into doing a Bible study was that, and I'm, I'm thankful for that. And there's been a lot of other uh, books that I've used over the years for finding information. Um, I think, re- was it, re- I think it's Regular Baptist Press. This is, we're going back, you know, 35, 40 years ago, right? Um, they had these little booklets that they sold all the time. Uh, I used to go to a Christian bookstore in our area, and I'd pick them up. And, and they were really simple Bible studies. Um, I remember, um, of course, um, I always say this with a caveat, you know, I was a big Charles Rory fan, and um, used to read a lot of his books. Um, he, of course, you know, I, if, you, if you know his background, Presbyterian background, so you've got to be really careful about his doctrine. But uh, I didn't care about that, you know, 40 years ago. Um, I wouldn't know a Presbyterian if they bit me back then, you know. Um, but I used to read a lot of his books. I remember getting one of his books. It was called Balancing the Christian Life. And uh, I was beginning to read that. And my pastor had given me an opportunity of teaching Sunday school class. And so I said, would you mind if I just use this as a, you know, as a, um, as a framework? And he said, no, go for it. And um, I... That, that book, um, I taught two years' worth of Sunday school lessons out of it. Um, what it did for me is every one of those chapters, it forced me into the Word of God, and I developed Sunday school lessons from those things myself to teach. Uh, but I learned a lot of stuff going through that. And um, things, you know, things I never even, never even knew about as far as, you know, my faith goes. And so it really forced me to learn a lot of things. But, it, but I, I'm just saying that there's a lot of good materials out there, a lot of good Bible studies uh, available. So much stuff's online nowadays. You know, you don't have, I don't, I don't, I guess there's still Christian bookstores around where you can actually buy books themselves. But um, there is so much good material in there. Um, I, I just want to remind you that the best Bible studies are the ones that get you in the Bible. Because a lot of Bible studies are just commentaries. Someone has, has done, the, had done the work, and they're just giving you their opinion about everything. Um, I'm not a big fan of those. Um, and they're fine, but I'm not a big fan of them because the purpose of a Bible study is to study your Bible and not just read somebody's commentaries. Um, you know, we have those uh, daily devotions that we get every month, and I'm... I've expressed my opinions about daily devotions before, and I'll just say them again. They're, they have a purpose, but if that's the only thing that you're getting a dose of every day is a short little paragraph, um, then you're really missing out on some stuff. They, they, they serve a good purpose, but they're not the end um, of, um, of, of the study, okay? Okay. Um, but a lot of a lot of daily commentary, a lot of daily Bible studies like that. All they are is a commentary that somebody gives about a particular verse of scripture. That's all that it is. And that, that honestly, that's not a Bible study. That's someone else's opinion about a verse of scripture. That's all that is. Now I know there's some good ones out there. Um, Charles Spurgeon, he wrote you know um, morning and evening devotions. He wrote uh, the evening devotions. Um, they have lasted what 150 years and are still being sold today. Okay. Great stuff. Um, but again, that's just a, that's a commentary that someone has written about some particular verses of Scripture. That's all that is. That's not a Bible study. A Bible study gets you in the Word of God where you're looking things up. You're actually studying. And so um, I do, uh, do want to help you, um, you know, any way I can. If, you know, if, there's, you know, if there's materials you're looking for, if they're going to help you out, you know, please let me know. But um, um, there, there are some good materials out there that you can use, okay? But um, uh, you do have to understand, especially if you're using other materials, that there is a line. 
um, there's a line between Bible truth and opinion about Bible truth. There's a line there. And, um, you know, I, I, I have said this. I'm a big Spurgeon fan. And, uh, but it's still, it's, 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 every time you write something, it is of his opinion. Um, all of Charles Rari stuff that I used to read, you know, 30 plus years ago. Um, it's still, I, there's a lot of good stuff. You know what I like about Charles Rari? He is simple. He's plain. He explains things very well. Um, not a lot of garbage. I can read his, um, his descriptions about particular doctrines and say, yes, I understand that. I, I like him yeah, for that uh, because of his format. Um, I don't agree with all his theology, but I like his writing. Uh, but it is his writing. Um, many of you have uh, study Bibles. Um, you have commentary at the bottom. Great, great stuff. I, I, am not, I have no objection to study Bibles. I don't use a study Bible. And uh, one of the primary reasons I don't use a study Bible is because I have a lot of other resources and I don't want to clog up my Bible with all the other resources that I have on bookshelves and, and on my computer. So I, don't, I've, I have not had a study Bible in, I don't know, probably, probably close to 30 years is the last time I actually used a study Bible. And, and so, but there's a lot of good ones out there, Okay. Um, no objection to them, but just understand there's a line that is drawn between Bible truth and commentary. And you don't, just be careful you don't cross that line. And when somebody writes something, if it sounds good, amen. And if it is good, amen. But please remember, even when it is good, it's still their opinion. All right? Um, so um, getting Bible study material is, is nothing wrong. Now, what I want to talk about uh, this week and next week is uh, that second point about uh, getting into the Bible and studying. There is nothing better than studying the Bible on your own. Um, I'm not saying to the exclusion of other books. I, I use a lot of books to study my Bible. Um, but um, Bible study itself is a, is a tremendous um, exercise for every child of God. So... I, uh, what we're going to talk about um, is, uh, as you can see here, a um, couple different things by, by, the, by books of the Bible, by topics, uh, by necessity. Uh, Daniel's study was by necessity. And so there was something that was kind of working on him, and he was looking for some answers. So there was necessity. It was driven by necessity. And uh, there's a lot of times you, you do study the Bible by, simply by topic. I have no problem with that. I think it's a great idea, and it's, it's, it's well worth investment. Uh, but uh, studying the, the books of the Bible itself individually is, is a good exercise also. Um, I am, um, years ago, um, when I first started uh, teaching at Lehigh Valley Baptist Church, I, I teach a lot of theology classes, and I enjoy that. But I also had an opportunity of teaching uh, like uh, Old Testament, the uh, major prophets, minor prophets. Uh, I've, I've taught through the Pauline epistles. So there are you know, some big chunks. And um, the, um, when you talk about things like the major prophets and minor prophets, there's a lot of books involved. But one of the big key ingredients to understanding particular books of the Bible is to understand where they all fit. I'm a big picture kind of person. And... Um, and that's out of necessity for myself. I, if I want to understand it, I've got to see where all... It's, it's kind of like when you dump the puzzle out of the box. You set the box up with the picture on it so you can see what it looks like when it's done. I mean, that's, that's like a no-brainer, right? You want to know how this thing fits. So to me, getting the big picture is always so important. And, and so in any study of the Bible, you've got to know where things fit. You, 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 you know, we were just reading a couple different books. We were reading the book of Daniel. Well, where does, where does Daniel fit in? Where does it fit in historically? And, and then we, you know, we were looking, um, we mentioned the book of Nehemiah. Where does that fit in at? I, he talks about Ezra. There's a book of Ezra. Where does that fit? Um, when you get into the minor prophets, you know, we got them. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nehemiah, Habakkuk. Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. And then nice little package at the end of the Old Testament. But, you know, historically, they're all over the place. They're everywhere. 
different people, different time frames, preach to different folks. And what I often do when I'm um, doing um, personal Bible study, when I'm preparing messages, lessons, and things, I always start with trying to get a grip of the historical context. I, I know that sounds technical, but all that simply means is where does it fit? Where does this book fit? That, to me, that is such an important start. We're talking about you as a believer understanding your Bible. Where does this book fit? And I like to start there. And even to, you know, today still, you know, if I'm working on a, on a lesson somewhere and I'm reading a particular um, you know, portion of Scripture, I, 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 you know, in my own head I'm taking a couple steps back and I'm asking myself where does this fit on the timeline. One of the assignments that I give, um, that, I've, that I've given for um, uh, the major prophets class uh, is to make a timeline from the, um, um, the time of the uh, dividing of the kingdom all the way up to the time of Christ. And time frame of the, of the split kingdoms, a time frame of all the major and minor prophets, of all the empire, emperors, the emperors, yeah, the empires, you know, Babylonians, and the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Medo-Persians, the fall of the Medo-Persians, the Greek Empire comes in, and then the, eventually the Roman Empire, all these different kings uh, as they're you know, plugging all those in, some major things. And there's a lot of other events that happen um, that are not recorded in the scriptures, but they're global um, events that take place that are well historically accounted for. And you can plug those in along the way. I have some, some great timelines that students have built over the years. Some have done them um, digitally, um, had videos put together, have had you know just pieces of paper scrolled out, and and powerpoints and all kinds of stuff. And and uh, you know, however the student wants to do it, it's fine with me, as long as I get the understanding of what the big picture is. It is so important. I've got some books back in my library, which are just timelines. That there are there are it is. It's one of those things that I often do. I will often pull out a timeline and look and say, all right, what, what, what's going on now in this book and what's happening around it? What has happened before and what's going to happen after this? That is so important. That, um, of course, this is my opinion about this, but um, to me that is such a, a big part of it is understanding context and historical context is a big deal. So if you're going to sit down and do a Bible study and you're going to start with a book of the Bible and you're going to pick you know, maybe one of the epistles and you're going to ask yourself, okay, Paul the Apostle wrote this. When, when did he write it? Where is he writing it from? Is this early in his ministry, later on in his ministry? Um, is he the one who started this church? Where does this fit on his timeline as far as um, you know, his other ministries that have been happening? You just you, you find the point where it's at. Now, how do, you, how do you find out that information? How would you find out that information, Brother Stephen? Google it. Google it. There you go. All right. Because uh, I don't know. Google it. That's what it says right there. All right. Um, yeah, you can Google it. That's, uh, nowadays, <laughs> it is so easy to do. Um, Bible dictionaries. I, I've shown you my Unger's Bible dictionary. I've, I, I got I got. I got two of them right up here. So this one I bought at a used bookstore not too long ago. And so uh, I ought to probably give this. I give away a lot of books. And so if you need a Bible dictionary, let me know. Um, uh, Brother George last night was talking about this book. And I just dug it out of my library, The Way of Life Encyclopedia by David Cloud. And uh, so, um, you know, Bible dictionaries or um, um, Bible encyclopedias or Googling it. Um, there's a lot of great resources out there where it uh, really fills in the timeline. Um, like I said, I have a book uh, in my library. All it is is timelines. And I just, you know, a lot of times I'll just pull that out and just look at a timeline. Go, oh, there it is right there. Um, um, if you have a Bible um, that has the, uh, like an introduction to each one of the books of the Bible, that's a great place to start. It, again, it is commentary, I know that, but many, many books, many, um, many study Bibles will give you uh, a few introductory things on there. They'll give you a background like uh, who the author is, uh, the time that was written, 
and um, give you that kind of background in reference to that. And so whether it be the Old Testament or New Testament, it's going to give you a little bit of historical background. Read that. It's, to me, it's so important to understand the, um, the context behind the historical background. Um, one of the things I, I do want to say this, um, especially if you have a study Bible, it's, it, a lot of times it's easy to just kind of run to the commentary part of it and just start reading all the commentary. I mean, if that's, I have no objection to it, but if you're going to do a personal Bible study, you might as well um, start by doing a personal Bible study and not just reading everybody's opinion about it. I got shelves full of commentaries, and I've collected a lot over the years. And um, um, you know me, I don't, I, don't, I, don't pay, I don't pay full price on anything. A lot of the commentaries I have on my shelves, uh, I either got them for free, I got them for real cheap. Um, and it's and I, I have no objection to them, um, but I, they're they're probably the least used books in my library, and that was not always the case. Um, uh, pulpit commentary we've talked about that before. Um, when I um, when I first started teaching Sunday school uh, and things like that years ago, um, I didn't have I didn't have any books at all. I was uh, my father in law was uh, had a janitorial business, and I helped uh, clean for him. Uh, you know because I had nothing else to do when you're raising three kids at that time. Christian, you weren't born yet. Um, and so um, uh, one of the churches that we cleaned, Marcus Hook Baptist Church, had a really nice library. And so after I finished cleaning there, it was usually late at night, I would just go to the library and study and, and work on my, on my lessons and things there because they had a big library, big resources. They had the, uh, the, that pulpit commentary and I used to use that a lot. I would pull it off the shelf, and, and I had, they had a nice table there and everything. And I would use those commentaries, which was fine. I, I was young. I, I didn't know a lot of things. I learned a gob of stuff from that. Um, but commentaries are fantastic. But don't, don't make that the first thing you run to. Uh, spend the time doing the work yourself. Um, this, uh, the, the way the, you, you get the historic background, you understand you know, when the book was written, who wrote the book, who was written to. Um, so now you understand, you know, what is being said. You're thinking why, you know, it, it doesn't, um, you know, if you're going to be dealing with the nation of Israel about sinfulness or, you know, Obadiah is not even dealing with uh, the children of Israel at all, you know, the, and he's dealing with the Edomites. And, and so, you know, you're reading these things and you're, and you're beginning to understand, okay, that's why he says these things. That's why it's written in this format. That's why... Um, you know, there's like, for instance, I, what is it, the book of Obadiah, there's really no call for repentance at all. It's just, the, you're, I'm, I'm going to judge you, you're going to die, and that's it, you know. Well, that's a pleasant book to read. Um, well, why is God so harsh? Look, they're not his children. That's why he was so harsh. And, and so, you know, there's a lot of folks that jump into the Bible and they have no idea who's, who's, right, who's talking, who they're talking to, and why they're talking at all. And then they, they, they take a step back and they scratch their head and go, I don't understand. Well, you know, of course not. You're reading someone else's letter and you have no idea who the people are. So get the background, understand the context, know who's writing, who they're writing to. Now, one of the, one of the most basic things about Bible study, this is, again, this is my opinion on this. And I do this a lot. I'll read through a section, and I'll just take some notes. I'm a big note taker. Okay. So this is not a systematic type of thing at all. I'm just reading, and something will grab my interest, and I'll just jot a note down. There's a lot of times from that note, then I'll ask some more questions. Well, what does it, what does it have to do with anything? And then I'll start trying to follow through on that particular statement. Why is he saying that? Who is he talking to? What's this particular word? Um, this, um, this is a, I just want to, I, I pulled this out just before getting up here, but I just want to mention this before because we're almost out of time. This is a, uh, a um, uh, the new topical textbook. It's got some things in there by uh, um, Tory, R.A. Tory, but uh, it's just, it's cross-references. I, I love following cross-references. Um, and I, I, I used to use this book all the time. Now it's all digital. Um, I use online Bible, and it has a section called uh, Treasure of Scripture Knowledge, um, TSK. And TSK basically uses this and some other resources and gives you a, just a 
gazillion cross-references to every passage of Scripture you're in. And to, I use that tool every single day when I'm studying my Bible. Every time I study my Bible, I use some type of, of topical cross-reference. It's a, it's a tremendous... When this book came out, it was a tremendous resource. Some of you have like a Thompson chain reference Bible. Same type of thing, but this is on steroids, okay? It's got that plus a bazillion other things. And the digital version is even better. And so I use it all the time. And, and so it just, here, here's this particular phrase or a particular word or a particular subject matter. And here's everything in the Bible that may relate to it. Boy, isn't that tremendous? I use that a lot. Personal Bible study. I'm reading it. I'm now intrigued by a particular phrase that's used or a particular subject matter. And I, now I begin to link that to, you know, a hundred other places in the Bible. And I, now I start just a little bit at a time working my way through it. This is just a start. These are simple tools. This is not commentary. This is getting into your Bible, getting some background, and then beginning to understand where it fits in the bigger scheme of things. We're going to end there. I didn't even get started with this this, uh, this morning. We're going to talk a little bit more about personal Bible study next week. What I do want to ask you, if there are some resources and tools that you use, and you'd like to share that with the rest of our Sunday school class, uh, I would invite you to do that. We're going to talk a little bit about that next week. So I invite you, if you want to bring any of those resources with you, that's fine too. Or if you just want to talk about them, that's fine too. But we'll do that next week. Lord bless you, and thank you, <clears throat> excuse me, thank you for being in Sunday school this morning. Mm -hmm.